Hello and welcome to the first ever Health Equity Open Forum sponsored by UMass Memorial Healthcare. I am Gina Platanino, your moderator and a member of the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force established between UMass Memorial and the City of Worcester. We are coming to you from Revelation Studio in Worcester, Massachusetts, where our panelists are at a safe six feet apart and using state-of-the-art camera technology, so we are the only ones in the room. We are also only removing our mask when we speak. The COVID-19 pandemic has further illustrated the disparity in health outcomes for people of color. Nationally, the Latino and African American communities were disproportionately impacted in Worcester County, Hispanics represented more than a third of all COVID-19 cases while being only 13% of the population. The underlying cause of the major contributor for these health disparities is systemic racism. Systemic racism is not a new or novel issue caused by COVID, but instead is an epidemic that has affected our society in every level. The fact that we are meeting and beginning what we hope will be an ongoing conversation about this issue gives me hope that we have learned something from this pandemic. It's been an honor to work alongside my colleagues and community in the Health Equity Task Force, and now I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Eric Dixon, President and CEO of UMass Memorial Healthcare. Thank you, Gina, and thank you to all the panelists for being here today for this very important conversation. At UMass Memorial Healthcare, we aspire to deliver the same high quality health care to everyone, regardless of the color of their skin, their sexual orientation, or their gender identity. But sadly, I know that we often miss that mark. If I look at mammography rates for Latino women, they're lower than for Caucasian women. If I look at hypertension being in control for black men, there are lower rates than for Caucasian men. And sadly, as we look in the pandemic and who is getting the disease, people of color, Hispanic, African-American, are getting the disease at almost three times the rate of the Caucasian population. And that's not right. There are lots of reasons for this disparities in healthcare and these inequities that exist, systemic racism being one that you mentioned. An important one is that any of us that grew up in the United States, regardless of the color of our skin, likely have these unconscious biases in our mind. Despite our best intentions, we were, we were shown things and heard things during the course of our upbringing that impact later the decisions that we make. And those decisions sometimes discriminate against people of color. And so the only way to overcome those unconscious biases is to raise the level to the conscious, to have a conversation about it so that you can take action that will overcome what's happening in the unconscious mind. And that's what we're trying to do here today and at UMass Memorial overall, to raise this to the conscious where we can have a conversation and talk together like you're doing on the task force to come up with specific actions that we can take so that everybody gets the same level of health care regardless of the color of their skin. So thank you to everyone for allowing me to participate. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. I would now like to take a few seconds to introduce our Congressman Jig McGovern, who represents the second congressional district. Well, thank you, Gina. I'm happy to be here with, the, with this panel to have this important conversation. Um, you know, to, uh, to address some of the issues that we're talking about here today, we have to acknowledge that there is a problem, uh, that there are indeed racial disparities, that there is such a thing called systemic racism. And I tell people all the time that systemic racism doesn't mean all the systems are filled with racists. It means that the systems, as they have developed over a period of time, have developed in a way that uh, disproportionately disadvantage uh, certain people in our, our, our country. Uh, and, and mostly communities of color. Uh, and when we talk about addressing those um, disparities, we also have to talk about uh, the, um, the uh, uh, social determinants of health. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have to talk about race. We have to talk about uh, where somebody lives, whether they have access to uh, adequate housing, whether or not they are living in a neighborhood that's a food desert and they don't have access to good nutrition. Um, you know, there's a, whether they have a job that pays a livable wage. 
all those things um, impact somebody's health uh, as much as whether you have access to go see a doctor. Um, and so, you know, this discussion has to be wide ranging. One of the frustrations that I have had, and I know others have had, is that we've, uh, we've, we've, we've talked about uh, these issues, we've talked about the challenges, but they haven't necessarily translated into concrete action. Look, at this pandemic has shown us very clearly uh, the inequities that exist um, in our community, in our commonwealth, in our country. Um, but the reality is these inequities always existed. I mean, this is not, nothing new. They've just been uh, made worse because of this pandemic. Um, you know, people in low-income neighborhoods, uh, communities of color are being impacted more uh, by this disease. Uh, and, and, um, and they're dying at greater rates. So, so we, we, we have to put everything on the table. Uh, and we also need to come up with concrete, uh, a concrete plan, not just what in Washington, but right here in our community of things we can do to, uh, to deal with it. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Congressman McGovern, especially for saying that we need concrete actions. And I just want to take a second to remind those who are watching us that this forum is for you. So if you have questions for our panelists, please submit them, and our team will make sure to put them on our screen so we can ask them. Next, I am happy to introduce to you Dr. Maddie Castile, who is the Commissioner of Health and Human Services for the City of Worcester, and as a physician, has been a leader in the fields of substance use disorder and health equity. Thank you. So as Commissioner of Health and Human Services for the City of Worcester, I believe now more than ever, it's important not only to uplift health equity, but also to center health justice. To us, that means that we need to look upstream to implement and affect real change for our black, brown, indigenous, and immigrant communities that have historically been affected by systemic racism, which shows clearly when we look at the social determinants of health. As healthcare practitioners and public health professionals, we need to, we need to be anti-racist meaning we need to be recognizing, actively recognizing, that racism is pervasive and kills. We need to make sure our actions and intentionally create, and create equity, amplifying and centering the voices of those most impacted, because this is the only way that the quality of life for folks who are part of these communities will radically improve. To be anti-racist means taking course of action against systemic racism and oppression. In healthcare and public health, we need to center compassion, take the time to understand trauma, and validate the lived experience of these communities. Too often, we choose policies, bureaucracy, and following system rules over meeting the needs of those who've been systemically marginalized. We need to first recognize the role of institutions play as barriers to health equity, be, be, uh, barriers to health equity before, and before we break down and re-envision what healthcare really looks like. We need to take the time to really listen to what these communities need, believe them, validate them, and do anything we can to say yes instead of no. As a physician who works with Latino men struggling with addiction, I see how the health care systems interact. And I can give you an example firsthand, just even in a program that I started called the Hector Reyes House. There are rules that have been set up there, for example, um, that, that uh, staff will say can't be broken. If someone walks in an hour late or after curfew, they immediately get a demerit. I want to challenge us to think differently about our rules and regulations. How, how do we try to understand that person's individual needs? We have to remember that everyone has family or work or different things that come up in the life that may have made them late. We can't automatically just say no and write them off, kick them out of the program or take away their privilege as a form of punishment. The world isn't black and white and that life happens and things come up for everyone. We need to meet people halfway and really work with their unique individual needs. For us, health justice means naming racism as the root cause of health disparities and working together to constantly and actively fight against barriers that have been put in place as tools of oppression. First, we need to recognize that racism historically and presently exists throughout all of our systems and institutions nationally and locally. It manifests itself into negative health outcomes and ultimately shorten lifespans through the social determinants of health, which as we all know are the conditions and the places 
where people live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes. In the fields of healthcare and public health, we frequently start the conversation with health disparities, and we end with the social determinants of health without ever taking a closer look at what it all really means. The social determinants of health are a family that doesn't have a safe shelter or a place to call home. They are children without parks or other green spaces in their neighborhoods. They are schools that are poorly funded because they depend on, on property taxes that only, save, that only serve the wealthy. They are essential workers using public transportation during a pandemic to work 50 hours a week for minimum wage. We need to bring it back and remember the faces to humanize the social determinants of health instead of reducing these realities to an academic term. How do we take it a step further with what we know about the social determinants of health and apply it to a community? How do we stop saying we need housing and instead ask, how do we get housing? How do we build the housing? As a community, how do we reach, how do, how do each one of us work together to make equitable housing a reality? This is the conversation we need to have at this point. We also need to acknowledge that all of these social determinants are at the core, impacted by historical and, ra and systemic racism. However, generations of historical trauma and stress cannot be fixed only through dismantling the systems that don't work. In addition to making systemic changes that improve the daily lives of these communities, we truly need to look at changing the culture of how we think, perceive, and interact with black, brown, indigenous, and immigrant communities. This is why we must work and demand that all spaces, that all spaces we are part of, whether those that are institutions where we work, the boards we volunteer, or the businesses that we support, make collaborative efforts in anti-racist practices and policies. But we too, as individuals, need to make daily efforts to unlearn our racist behaviors and biases and change the ways we interact with communities of color. There is so much work need to do, the legacy of, ra of racism manifests itself when we look at health disparities, which we have long been privy to and are rooted in these systemic structures that have been created by the dominant white culture of our society. At the heart of racism in its various forms is a culture of white supremacy. According to research uh, professor at the University of, of Birmingham, David Gilborn, white supremacy is the condition where the interests and perception of white people are continually placed center stage and assumed as normal. His research identifies the culture of white supremacy as the political, economic, and cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources. Look around. Anywhere in Worcester, almost every leader of every institution is white. This means that their thought processes, the way these leaders see the world, make decisions, and center needs are solely based on their lived experiences as white people. This is not representative and does not center the lived experience of black and brown communities in Worcester which are almost a third of the city's population. Very rarely do you see a black or brown leader in a position of power through our current institutions. Instead, they are often placed in subordinate positions that don't hold any power. And those few who hold positions of power are just living in a white world where there are so many unspoken rules, opposition to new thought processes, and a constant struggle where those with the most power, predominantly white leaders, do not, do not want to step back and allow other voices to, be, to lead. It's time we critically look at our institutions and ask who makes the decisions, who sits at the table. Diversity and inclusion are only the first step in increasing our health care systems as anti-racist institutions. We can hire 100 brilliant black and brown participants, providers, administrators, and faculty, but without ever giving them the power to speak, be heard, or be uplifted. We continue to create a culture of white supremacy that enables trauma, minimizes them to a diversity statistic, and ultimately silences their voice. Often leaders of color are tokenized and used to act as the gateway and representative for their communities. However, without having the power to make decisions or speak freely, this results in, in harming relationships with our communities because they feel they've turned their backs on them. These leaders have, the, have to repeatedly endure their own traumatic stress as they work in spaces that never really value or validate their thought processes, decisions, or experiences. For this reason, it is essential to create pathways and mentorship opportunities so that we can have the representation that is needed in our institution, but also a support system that uplifts our voices and allows to, to, us to feel valued. It is also up to those 
who currently hold the power and sit at the table to demand, make, and hold space for new voices and opinions so that we can truly foster an inclusive culture. Simultaneously, black and brown leaders need to continue their, their fight in creating spaces that center and amplify their voices. Let me just leave you with some data points about racial disparities across all sectors of the social determinants of health. Nationally, Hispanic and foreign-born populations have the highest risk of work-related fatal injuries. For all cancers combined, the death rate is 25% higher for black people than for white people. Hispanics are 50% more likely than white counterparts to die of di diabetes or liver disease. Black women are up to four times more likely to die of pregnancy-related complications than white women. Childhood asthma is roughly three and two times more prevalent in Puerto Rican and black non-Hispanic children. Black men are killed by police at over twice the rate of their white counterparts. In Massachusetts, black and Latino men are incarcerated at rates seven and four times higher than white non-Hispanic men. Locally, in Worcester, Latinos have a poverty rate of two times higher than white counterparts. And in 2019, black and Latino Worcester public school students experienced discipline two times the rate of white students. And in 2017, black and Latino youth were arrested at 3.2 and 2.4 times higher than white youth. The infant mortality rate for Latino and black women are three times and two times higher than for white women. And 66% of our homeless youth in Worcester identify as Latino, black, and multiracial. I don't know about you, but these, are, these data points are disheartening. I ask all of you to think about what are you doing to change the legacy of racism. Remember, we all have a lot of unlearning to do, and the responsibility to dismantle per pervasiveness of racism and white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Castile, for giving us those, uh, that data. And I'm excited to get to the point where we can actually talk about solutions. But before we get to do that, I have two more panelists that I would like to introduce that can really contribute to this conversation. Um, Dr. Sarai Rivera serves at the Worcester City Council and is chair of its Standing Committee on Public Health and has worked in the, in the field of human services and mental health for over three decades. Dr. Rivera? How are you? Thank you um, for having me. Um, people, I am, this is like a really, really important forum, and I really want to thank everyone involved um, putting this together. This isn't just about um, numbers or information or data, which is extremely important, right? Like, I think because that like when you hear everything Dr. Castile said, it, it, it shakes you to the core. Um, the reality is that people are dying unnecessarily. The reality is that there's empty seats at people's tables, that um, there's a birthday that is being missed. Um, there's a holiday that they won't be there. And the only reason that this happens is because of who they are, because of race or gender or sexual orientation. Um, when you think about that, it makes absolutely no sense that someone would be treated differently um, because there's this sense of um, inequality, because there's this, in, this is inequality that's existing in, in, our, in our society. And as much as we want to kind of declare um, that we have reached the mountaintop, we haven't. And um, I commend um, the fact that we are having this conversation because I understand this conversation is not easy. And so if there's one thing that we can say is the silver lining um, in regards to COVID, is that for many of us who've been working in the health field for a number of years, we realize that um, this is something that we've all confronted. We've all seen, we've seen with our patients, we've seen with our family members, we've seen with even ourselves, the inequity in healthcare. However, many times when we would discuss this, it was, um, kind of dismissed of many times by we're race baiting 
or you're just being divisive or um, here we go again, you know, the same kind of race conversation, uh, you know, we're living in this free country. And um, th for me, we can't heal what we can't, we're not willing to put forward to admit is wrong. And this isn't um, a finality. And, and it's just like Congressman said, just because we have systems who are racist, doesn't mean that everybody's in there is just, you know, with a tiki torch and, and a little, you know, this white hat. Um, racism is not binary. And that's how we think about it. We have to think if you're racist, you're this really bad person. And if you're not racist, then you're this good person. The reality is that we live in a society where we have been embedded with biases since day one. Um, if you look at just even basic cartoons um, that many of us grew up with, it is outrageous. Shows like, um, the, I'm going to date myself here. The Lone Ranger, the fact that the person, um, his sidekick was Tonto, but the reality is um, that Tonto, Tonto is actually kind of, it really comes from Tonto, right? This just has the English accent. And Tonto in Spanish, right, in the Latin language means dumb, means ignorant, means stupid. Um, and we grew up with that. How many of us grew up watching Dukes and Hazards with the Confederate flag on that car that everyone revered. There's um, Disney, the fact that the crow in, in Dumbo was called Jim Crow. So those are just some examples. Now, these systems have were never created for us, right? Laws were not created to protect women um, initially, for example, were not protected to guide people of color. And also people of color have been hurt by the healthcare system. Tuskegee, um, we look at what happened with the um, sterilization in, in Puerto Rico of women, um, the experimentation. And so we've, we've, um, we've seen time and time again, this hurt that's been caused now when you see this panel and this discussion, this gives us all this hope to say, we could actually do something about this. It's not enough to say, I'm not racist. It's, it's time for us to start doing anti-racist work. It's, it's not enough, it's, it's, it's important for us to be doing anti-bias work. For us to be able to check ourselves, check our intersectionality and say, what can I do to better this situation? So. There's not someone sitting across an empty chair at the dinner table. So come the holidays, they will be able to share with their loved ones. That come a birthday, they will be able to blow out yet another candle. And that will only happen if we collectively are open to be able without defensiveness, without dismissiveness, without, you know, without kind of like this, oh, I don't know if we can talk about that, to be able to be open because you know what? The good thing is, yes, it is hard to have this conversation. Yes, it could be challenging in so many aspects. And yes, we're gonna have to look within ourselves to really look and say, hmm, how have I contributed to some of this? But the great thing is that we collectively can also do something about this. And that's what this forum is about is the work that we're doing collectively to, to, to change this, the work that we wanna be doing and the hope that we can actually collectively make a difference and change this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. You've given us quite a lot to think about, especially since Thanksgiving is right around the corner and there'll definitely be missing people on the table or we won't be able to get together. Our next speaker Sorry. is Dr. Tabaya Salman who's an internal medicine specialist in the UMass system with Health Alliance Clinton Hospital, where she serves on the Hospital Minority Council, which focuses on how to combat institutional racism and identity issues that affect disadvantaged, underserved populations in our community. Dr. Salman. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to be a part of this uh, panel. Uh, my name is Tayaba Salman. As Gina said, that I am working as a hospitalist in uh, Health Alliance Hospital. Being an immigrant physician by myself, um, I have been seeing the disparities of culture which are existing in different organizations throughout our country. And uh, I have seen that, you know, since I'm a part of South Asia, I have seen that how 
the uh, low socioeconomic status people and especially low income people are even uh, struggling very hard in this country as well. That has really moved me and I really wanted to uh, start thinking about it that, you know, what I can do at my level to uh, bring some change in our, our culture. And I'm so thankful to Health Alliance Hospital that they have provided a platform to all of us uh, that in the form of this uh, minority advisory committee, which I have joined recently, uh, our committee is consist of uh, a lot of people who belong to different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, they belong to uh, these are actually all the um, hospital workers. They belong. They are immigrants. They are non English speaking people, um, and we all sit together. And few of us are actually um, there are public uh, and community health workers as well. So we all sit together, talk about um, how our patients are. Um, people who are working with us are actually being affected by these disparities. And we um, note down these points, discuss these points with each other. Um, and it's really surprising uh, since the time I've been joined this, uh, this committee that how many things that they exist, which, uh, which is, I should say that it's uh, like, a, you know, a, some kind of a conscious, unconscious, biased, uh, how our, our organizations are. Um, and our job is to take these points uh, and then bring it to our leadership so that we can reform the policies which we have um, and so that we can build uh, an organization which is culturally competent as well as create an environment which is empathetic for everyone and create an organization which is not, uh, you know, just to sh somebody to fit the organization but to but to change the organization to fit everyone. Uh, and that's what we are doing, and uh, that's why I'm here with you. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your remarks. And now we're getting to the part of the program where you get to participate, and I'm really excited to see all of your uh, questions. Um, so before we get started, um, here's a question to all of you. Because of your background, you know, we have Dr. Rivera at City Council. We have Dr. Dixon. You lead one of the largest um, health centers. Congressman McGovern, you lead at the federal level. And Dr. Salman, you're looking at the insides of a local hospital. And Dr. Castillo, you're at a city level or overseeing our Department of Public Health. Considering everything all of you just said, can this problem be fixed? I know it's a big question <laughs> and very broad, but is this something that we can fix? I think the answer is yes, but we're not going to fix it all at once. I mean, we're all praying for a safe, effective coronavirus vaccine that puts an end to this pandemic. Unfortunately, there is not a vaccine under development for racism, and there's not a simple cure that is going to fix the problems that have um, been developed and part of the system for hundreds of years. But we can make progress, and I think we have made progress in the country, and I think now is a moment to make even greater progress. And I think data is powerful. You have to, you, you listen to the data points that Maddie talks about, and you say, wow, we need to do something about that. So first, we look at the data, and then we need to get to the point of specific actions. And, and that's where we're at now, is that we've learned together, we've talked about the data, now what are we gonna do about it? And I think that what we're trying to encourage is action at this point. Um, and certainly we have a lot of different actions that we're gonna be taking at UMass Memorial uh, for this. Wonderful, thank you for saying that. And a big part of that is collaboration. So I wonder, you know, Congressman McGovern, you hear all the data, you see it in and out. You're one of our leaders when it comes to food insecurity, which we know has been impacted and there have been greater numbers because of COVID. Based on this conversation um, and based on actions, because you really are in a place where you can make concrete actions and steps, what can we do from there? Uh, well, first of all, I think as everybody has acknowledged, uh, this, th there's not one simple solution here, right? I mean, if we're talking about food insecurity, there are a whole bunch of things we need to do to deal with food insecurity. When we're talking about uh, lack of uh, affordable housing or we're talking about disparities in education. So we have to look at this whole issue more holistically. Uh, we ha all have to, uh, you know, and when I say we all, I mean the people in power, whether they're the heads of hospitals or, the, or, or politicians or the heads of our business community, all have to acknowledge the reality of systemic racism um, and how it has undercut, uh, you know, our, our society in so many different ways. 
Uh, but on the federal level, look, we need to make sure that, there, that, that, that we are providing assistance and federal funds to support good models, to support uh, communities that are actually making progress in trying to eliminate health disparities. Uh, you know, we need to talk about making sure that, uh, you know, we have universal free breakfast and lunch at school for everybody so that everybody's getting a good meal in our school system. We know that if, if people are, are hungry, if students are hungry, they can't learn. And so that, that meal is every bit as important to that child's ability to learn as a textbook. Uh, we need, uh, you know, I'm pushing legislation now, you know, to, uh, to empower doctors to provide uh, medically tailored meals to patients. I mean, doctors can write up prescriptions for all these fancy pharmaceuticals, but sometimes what is most important is access to good nutrition. Why can't we give doctors uh, that ability? So there are a whole bunch of things that need to be on the table. The final thing I'm going to say is that as important as it is, it is for us to have all these ideas, uh, you know, that, that song from Hamilton in the room where it happens, right? I think it's important to make sure that the communities that are most affected are in the room where it happens, that they are part of the process to decide, you know, what are the answers, what are the solutions. You know, we all have our ideas, but we need to make sure that the communities that have been most adversely impacted by the disparities are in that room and helping us formulate those solutions. Uh, thank you, Congressman McGovern, for saying that. And as a follow-up, you know, I, I'm going to ask all of you the same question. I know we have other questions coming in from UMass, but yes, it's important for our communities to be able to speak, but how do you create those safe spaces where they feel free to share those? Because we know, especially you, Dr. Salman, you interact with these communities in the day in, day out. Same, same thing with you, Dr. Castillo. The, the, the work that you have done is amazing. You know, Dr. Rivera, you see these communities in and out, but they need some sort of filter or they need someone to speak to them. How do we empower them? Or how do we create a space where they feel free to reach out to our state and federal delegation, to our city council? Like you said, in Worcester, the Latino population it has been affected to higher limits. How do we increase representation? Going back to a little bit of what, what, what you said as well, when the people in power are primarily pretty white, how do, we, how do we talk to them? How do we make these safe spaces for them to contribute? How do we make your patients, your clients, to these spaces where they can elevate their voices so that they can uh, shape public policy at the state and the federal level? You want to go first? So. So th that's a very good uh, question and a very good point. And this is exactly what we were discussing actually just recently in our committee. Um, we all talk about, you know, the housing and poverty. We are talking about healthcare. We are talking about transportation and all these problems. But we are talking about, and I, to me, it just feels like, you know, that uh, it's like we are dancing around the core, and our core is actually these populations, the low socio-income populations, the population we are talking about, the ethnic populations. Uh, we have uh, immigrant populations and the population who don't speak English. These are the populations that been, they've been missed for a very long time. Um, and in order to reach up to this population, we have to break these walls and we have to go to our communities or either we should find some representatives from these communities to coming to us. Because unfortunately, what I'm seeing in, in our our hospitals and what we are talking about, we talk about patient experience, we talk about uh, that we, our readmissions are getting up or, or things like that. What is most impacting right now is this, that these populations which we are talking about, they have no access to come to our healthcare system. And by the time, because think about, I come from, a, from South Asia, I'm, I'm from Pakistan. When you see people, when they have to uh, actually, you know, uh, they have to choose between food, between bills, between health care, or between, um, you know, transportation. The health actually goes behind when the food comes first. And this, this is what we are, with, with the challenges we have with these populations. So it's very imp important that we have to go to either to these communities or either have to bring someone from their communities who they trust and then, you know, bring the, uh, uh, our work forward. Uh, because by the time they will come to us, they either come and seek help from us at the time when they are very sick because they are, you know, putting behind their health issues. And it's going to be already too late. They've, they have probably have missed their vaccinations, their preventive you know, care and a lot of things. So I think it's important that instead of waiting here and then wait for them that they will come and seek help from us, we have to go and then have to find something. Oh, I, I wholeheartedly agree um, with, your, with your comments. And 
I think that one of the things that we just recently did, which was the, the COVID-19 task force between UMass and the city of Worcester, um, to me was one of the places that um, brought the community to also talk about, you know, what their thought process was, where they feel that, that people need to go to, um, to look at the community and say, how can you help us access the people that are there? We want to be able to test them. We want to bring them you know, all the outreach, all the masks, all the sanitation, the, um, you know, the, the sanitation that we're going to use, the cleansers, um, all of that, bringing it to, to the community is an important piece. And the fact that that is what you want to happen and that outreach needs to continue to happen. And then looking forward, even when we do the vaccine, that, that, that's the method that we're going to do, that we're going to be able to involve the community in things that we do. And then we'll move on. I think the most important piece that you were talking is, is I think our voices have to be valued. And that's, that's a huge piece that, that needs to happen. And I, I gather that everybody has their own lived experiences for things for, for their lives. And, and, and so do we. And it's very different at times. And so how do we share those values together so that you can understand what the community is saying um, and vice versa? Um, and that, I think, is an important piece that I'm hoping that part of what we're doing with the task force is a huge piece. And, and so moving forward in that sense. Wonderful. And, you know, Dr. Salman, because you brought it up, I'm going to turn this question to Dr. Dixon because you might have the answer. Um, you know, you have difficulty bringing people to come into your hospital. And we know this. We deal with this in and out. If it comes into feeding my kids or taking care of myself and my health, my kids are going to come first. This is definitely. Yeah. So the few families that you do happen to get through your door, does UMass have any sort of plans on stratifying yeah. some key quality performance methods by race and ethnicity to see how, whether or not your methods are working or what sort of outreach you need to implement? And I think uh, the answer is yes. And not just to stratify the key quality metrics by race and ethnicity, but also to develop specific plans to close the gap where it exists. And to be transparent about that data, in fact, for the, for the upcoming year, our, one of our big targets is well child visits for um, uh, Latino children and, and black children compared to Caucasian children. There's a gap there, a big gap. And there's lots of reasons for that gap, right? If, if you're struggling with food security, uh, housing security, or job security, and you don't have transportation, well, it's a little hard to get to a well child visit. Mm -hmm. But if all those things are secure for you, well, of course you're gonna bring your kid to the pediatrician to be seen. And so in that example, um, there's a gap that exists and we're gonna close the gap this year for that particular one and for other metrics. So first we measure, then we develop specific countermeasures plans to address the gap where it exists. And you know, I, I'm hoping at the end of this year, we're all really proud and can at least show one great example of how we made a difference. And I wish we could close all the disparity gaps that exist across our system and across healthcare. But you know, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step and we're certainly gonna be taking that big step this year. Can I, can I add to uh, Dr. Dixon? Because he, they are doing, um, I think, um, the anchoring institution piece that you are working yeah. on, talking about how to, how to solve this, how do we talk about housing, and, and what are we going to do about housing, because we talk about it, right? Um, and I think that the model of anchoring institutions, so we wait for somebody to do it. Who's going to do it? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the idea of, of having the, the organizations, the, the large nonprofits, any, any uh, organization who has some financial capabilities, to be able to say that housing is a huge piece in our community yeah. and to be able to put money together and say, not only are people going to benefit, the community is going to benefit, um, health care costs are going to go down if we start providing housing for people. Just the cost of somebody who's homeless is, is incredible. Yeah. And then what do we do for that person? We just gave them a house. We're going to give them medical treatment, all of it. It's going to reduce costs. And so... Um, Doug Brown, who's working on, on anchoring institutions and, and, and building, um, looking to, to, to do that in, in, a, in a larger way. I'm hoping that that's a piece that we could get to a bigger conversation with all the, all the um, agencies in, in Worcester and really say, this is an issue in our community. You're a model of that, of what you're doing. How do we get everybody else to say, let's do that piece? Let's, let's build housing. 
And I think in, in other things, in the creative hub that we just invested in down in South Maine that bring, is going to bring arts to a neighborhood that right now is, is very underserved. And, you know, is the large, largest employer in the region and, and, and other large employees in the region, you, you have a set of resources, you have an investment portfolio, you have jobs that you can create, you buy a lot of product. And so I think we have a responsibility, especially in healthcare, to not just address the medical care, which is primarily what we do, but to focus on those social determinants health. And our board right now is in a place where they're saying, okay, let's pick some neighborhoods and transform them. And I had a, a conversation with Jack Roach, the CEO over Hanover Insurance today, and, and he's in the same place. He's like, we have a responsibility to use the resources, our hiring capabilities, our purchasing capabilities, our investment portfolios, to, to improve the overall health of the communities that, where we work. And I think that you know, we're in a place where we're having a great conversation. Hanover Insurance has done a lot of that work over the years, especially in downtown uh, Worcester. Uh, but we can't have just a couple of institutions. We need every major employer in the region to commit to hiring out of underserved neighborhoods, neighborhoods where there's a high percentage of the population living in poverty, to buying from minority and woman-owned businesses when we're using our purchasing power, and to be willing to lend some money and make an investment. You know, there's an expectation that it returns at a low interest rate for housing developments that otherwise won't get uh, the money they need to get started. And so we're doing that now, and Hanover has done it for years, and we're going to encourage other companies in the region to join us uh, in that work. Were you going to say something? Thomas? Yeah, well, I, I, I was going to say one of the other issues that I think we need to uh, understand is that there's a great fear, uh, especially within the immigrant community, about coming forward. Um, and, you know, even if the services are available, coming forward and, and being able to utilize them. I remember, uh, you know, last summer I was doing a, a, a tour of summer feeding programs all across my district, and uh, I was in Lemonster, and I was told by the person who was overseeing it that uh, a number of children uh, that usually would come to this were not coming to it because mm -hmm. they were afraid. And, um, and he said, it's, and it's not that they're undocumented or even that their mother or father is undocumented, but they may have an uncle or a cousin that, who may be undocumented, yeah. and they're afraid that if they come yeah. forward, you know, that they'll be asked questions or that they will be denied, um, you know, denied the food. So, you know, the, let's not underestimate uh, the chaos caused by the rhetoric coming out of this administration on, immigra on immigrants in general. And um, it really is destructive, um, and a lot of people aren't coming forward um, because they're afraid, uh, and we, we need to change all of that. We need to, we need to have a community in a country that is welcoming uh, as well as compassionate. So speaking about, I'm uh, so glad that you brought this point about, you know, trust issues which uh, immigrant community do have uh, that exist over here. Working as a frontliner, um, I've, I've been taking care of COVID patients and uh, just recently had a patient of my own. Uh, she was Hispanic, as we all know that COVID has been hit to our Hispanic uh, population to the most. Um, they actually, I was speaking to them and, you know, with an interpreter, and then they uh, said that, doctor, we don't want our mom to be a guinea pig that you are, the medications which you are getting, are they FDA approved? For some reason, COVID has made pay, people very health literate. Uh, so they know what FDA is do, doing, what are the new medications are coming. And, and having just a COVID-19 infection is itself very scary. And then on top of it, if the patient and families has this uh, fear that we are not using them as, as a research product or something like that, that was, that was a very eye-opening for me. And then it took me hours to make them realize that, look, we are not using it. We are doing it what we are doing for every patient over here. And that's very important that we have to, um, you know, move forward, especially, and that's why our committee is actually proposing to our leadership also that, you know, our, uh, the, the interpreters which we use, they should be used, not only used as interpreters, but as educators uh, so that they can, you know, bring the work forward. Right. And just, you know, Sarai brought up earlier, you know, kind of the history of uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the Tuskegee experiment mm -hmm. and the uh, experimentation on Puerto Rican women with regard to contraception and how people died people were uh, were sterilized and so there is you know there is a history uh, in this country uh, of, of, of some really horrific practices that still carry over right so it's not surprising when people 
come forward and say, I don't want to be used, uh, you know, as an experiment. Um, and again, so trust is a big part yeah. of this. Uh, and not just within the immigrant community, but within communities of color in general, because there is this history that we have. Yes, I think that's, I, I appreciate that congressman who stated that. Um, and, and what I want people to understand is that this isn't, um, when we think history, it's not just my great grandmother, right? Or my great, great grandmother. But the reality is I actually was doing therapy. Um, I'm also a clinical therapist and work in the health field. I was doing therapy with a woman several months ago and, um, you know, come to find out as we were doing some history of, you know, doing her psychosocial is that um, she was part of the forced abortions. Um, so there was like um, sterilizations and forced abortions that were done on, on um, Puerto Rican women um, and how she just lost this child um, just so unexpectedly when she was perfectly healthy. And it was just right after an appointment. It was just, you know, everything in, in um, the fact that, um, issues of medical, you know, that my parents couldn't just go to any clinic in New York City, um, that my siblings um, could only go to specific clinics. My older siblings um, lived through so much of these um, segregation and issues when you, um, the fact that uh, many times um, we're viewed as, his, you know, histrionic or hysterical um, and not really attended to. And I, I hear those stories time and time again. Just a few months ago, I had a young woman who um, was going, is, had a very difficult pregnancy. Um, the, her mother called me. Um, she called me, she's crying. And I said, you, you need to go to the hospital. And she said, well, the doctor's not sending me. I said, I told the mother, call an ambulance right now. Um, Cause I bet you any amount of money she's gonna get admitted. Um, and sure enough, she was. And um, had she not, um, she was at a high risk herself and, and, and losing the child. Um, and the fact that the doctor didn't listen to what she was saying was very problematic. So there is this level of like, um, when I told her, I said, you know, you know, she's like, you know, the doctor thinks I'm just kind of making this up. There is this trust issue um, that's very complicated. And I'll, I'll be honest, when I, when there was a lot of the news and, and I give props to Dr. Castiel because she, know, she knows I, I admire her greatly. Um, when I saw some of the Latino leaders, you know, getting the vaccine, um, people were like, you're going to get it? I said, peace out. No way. I'm not going to be a guinea pig. Um, I, I really, I have, you know, I really was concerned. I had significant trust. I was like, no, I'm going to wait for a whole FDA. I'm going to wait for like a whole first group. I'll be on the third or fourth. I'll do something else. And, and I'm immune compromised. And I definitely um, want to have vaccine. But I, you know, I, I said, oh. Why they why they got promote the Latino leaders getting vaccine? What's up with that? Um, so you, you think about right. I have a I've grown here, educated here, have a high level of education, work in the health field, and I have those doubts. So think about everyone else. And even my my one of my sons says, "Oh, I, I want to do the trial of the vaccine," and I said, "I don't think so. <laughs> no, you're not going to be a guinea pig." And that's how we feel. I mean, there's um, there's a number of different um, history and just what's happening now, situations that happen now, people who were told one thing or not paid attention to, and then their cancer, by the time, you know, they were hurt, their cancer was out of control or a situation that they could have taken care of. Issues of mental health, huge in how people are being treated. The fact that we don't have enough providers. I think um, one of the panelists talked about um, the fact that we need providers, we need people in leadership. And when you don't see someone, you're being told something and the person doesn't look anything like you, thinks about the things that you're saying is crazy, doesn't identify, you know, um, yeah, you have to understand, you know, like the way you deal with culturally and medicine um, is very challenging. And so people are very leery of this. And so gaining that trust is going to be really important. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rivera. So yes, Dr. Castillo and I were the guinea pigs, so we understand. <laughs> but you brought a very valid point of there is this <laughs> the, the, there is this hesitancy of you know people of color accessing the the, the services um, that are provided, the safety net benefits, and statistics show it right where benefits are going and who has more access to that. And even though that is people of color who have a higher poverty rate, they're not accessing it. Um, so it brings my question, and we have a few minutes left, so we'll be short on this, but you know, to the city council and to the city, how can you work to make sure that our city is more immigrant friendly? Uh, at the federal level, Dr. Con uh, 
Congressman McGovern, I don't want to put you <laughs> on the spot because there's very little right now that, that you can do with your votes. Uh, but, you know, you masked, um, you know, what can you do as patients are coming in? How do you work with those biases? Because you stated from the beginning that we all have those individual biases, regardless of the color of our skin. You know, what sort of training we could do? And then any services that the city is utilizing through your department, Dr. Castile, how do we work through that? Um, so just a few minutes, but, you know, Dr. Rivera, Dr. Castile, and, and Dr. Dixon. Yeah, I, I'd love to be able to answer some of that right now. Um, I'm a believer that, um, you know, the, and so kind of putting my pastor hat, my pastoral hat on, it says, you know, uh, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Ignorance is deadly. The reality is, um, and the lack of knowledge can be deadly. So I think that people are dying because we're not having these conversations about equity and about race um, and about unfairness um, and about how people are treated. Um, the reality is that, you know, I know people that will hold to um, really significant situations and not go to the doctor because they're afraid of deportation or someone in their family to be deported. Why? Because they've actually seen one of their families to be deported. Um, the reality is when, you know, things that, that we're taught to be, um, to have that safety net, you know, to trust in has been the very institution that has failed us. And so I think it's really important for us to educate ourselves. So even though I, I have, I come from a position of privilege in the sense of that I'm Puerto Rican. So my, if I have a passport, it's blue. I have, I have citizenship. We're one of the only Latinos that have um, citizens, that we are US citizens. Um, so I, I couldn't understand the plight of um, a Guatemalan mom, right? But when I came to Guatemala and I met with my son's mother and saw the pain in her eyes of not being able to see her son and the years that would have to go before she saw her son, until he became a citizen. Um, it changes the dynamic when you hear the stories of what it means to leave something behind, um, to leave everything. Like imagine if I take you, drop you in the middle of Hong Kong and say, figure it out, right? The journey, no one, you know, we have this anti-immigration, but we have to learn. Once we learn these things, when we have actually social relationships. So one of the things that I would encourage people is to have these social relationships. So when we hear certain things on the news, we don't just think of an image. When we talk about people who are transgender, transgender, you know, women of color um, is not just this image that we, that society has created, but if we have authentic social relationships with folks, we learn from these relationships. And when we hear those words or categories that people want to place, we actually, we're not gonna think of just the image that people put out there and many times is, is demonized, but we're actually, I'm actually thinking of this mom. I'm thinking of someone like my son. I'm thinking of someone like I, you know, someone, a transgender woman who I know has had to go through um, difficulties or, 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 you know, someone that I know um, in my district that said, I haven't seen a doctor in over five years um, because she feels very uncomfortable. She had a really good relationship with her last doctor, um, Dr. Castillo, by the way, and it ruined it for everyone. And she, but the reality is that she's very concerned because of being transgender. She knows that she just can't go to just any doctor. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very, that's very difficult. So when I hear that, it's these images that we have. We have to stop, we have to stop politicizing humanity. Mm -hmm food, shelter, equity, fairness, life. We have to stop politicizing humanity. Um, that's the reality. When we think about it, we've been caught up in too much of, uh, whether we're Democrat, Republican, Green Party, whatever that is, you know what? There's certain things we're having a conversation that is about basic human needs, basic humanity. When did we lose that in our society? So if we can build authentic relationships with folks, Get outside, think about who are your friends? Who's in your social circle? Expand that, right? Educate yourself, even if it's hard, even if we have to test and we have to look within ourselves and, and challenge our own intersectionality. Understand our privileges 
and then think about that it's no longer enough to say I'm not racist. If you're not actively working on anti-racism and anti-bias work, then you are also part of the problem. I know that might be difficult for you to hear, but that's the reality. And in Worcester, we are having major challenges, major challenges right here in the city. But at the same time, look at this panel. This is probably one of the most diverse panels of leadership that I have seen, and I'm proud to be a part of this. And I am so proud that we are actually having this conversation because it, it says we are, we've been waiting for this change. We've been waiting for this opportunity. We've been waiting for change to occur. And we can no longer continue to wait and not be an active voice, an active participant for that change. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. And unfortunately, we're running out of time soon, but I think we said it from the beginning that this is just the beginning of a conversation. Okay. So hold on to your questions, but I'm going to turn it over really quickly to Dr. Dixon to you know, follow up on that conversation. And I know you have some great news. We, we started this with saying conversation and action. And I know you actually have some exciting news to share about those actions. I think Dr. Rivera hit the nail on the head, right? That I used to believe that treating everyone was the same was enough, right? Regardless of the color of their skin. But you, you have to go above and beyond that. You have to treat people of color, people of skin colors different than mine uh, in an anti-racist way it, because they have been discriminated upon their whole lives up to that moment that I'm encountering them. So if it's a patient that I'm seeing, I have to treat them, uh, I can't just treat them like a, a, a Caucasian patient. I have to treat them differently. I have to realize the journey that they've been on and what's that been like for them. And I think, if, you know, my friend Valerie teaches us that we have to take a equity pause, mm -hmm. right? As we're about to make a decision, as you're about to encounter a patient, take that pause and just put the anti-racism lens on and say, well, maybe this will impact our decision. And so one of the things we're doing at UMass Memorial is we were uh, announcing our innovation fund. And we were going to just, you know, it's always over a million dollars where employees can apply for grants to try and do something different, innovative. And we love innovation at our health science system. But we took an equity pause and we said, we have to carve out a portion of those funds just to fund innovative things in and around the equity and inclusion space. Because just saying, yes, they can apply with, uh, along with every other type of grant isn't enough. You have to take action above and beyond what, we, you, what we, you would do in otherwise. So that, that pause and that lens, it really helps you make better decisions and I think it'll help us make progress over time. Wonderful. Do you have any other words to share about the grant from UMass? No, we're, we're excited for any of our caregivers that are listening today. I want you to think about what uh, things that you'd like to try and, and finding new, better ways that will create equity within the care that we deliver to our patients and inclusion within our caregiver groups because we don't just aspire to be um, the best place to give care. We have to be the best place to get care as well. And that means equity and inclusion both have to be important. I, the only other thing I'd say is that this is an opportunity for us and I think this community to lead, mm -hmm. right? To not just follow along with everyone else, to take a stand and say, yes, racism exists. It's about a history that most of us weren't a part of, but now that we know and we understand and we acknowledge that it exists, let's take action, let's work together to make this a better place, a better Worcester for everyone. Wonderful. It's always great to be in a place where we need more time and not uh, waiting for the event to be over. So thank you again for everyone who joined us. If we did not get to your question, it will be answered for a couple of UMass staff. Thank you again, Dr. Castile. Thank you again, Dr. Rivera, Dr. Salman, Congressman thank McGovern, you. and Dr. Dixon for all of your words. Feel free to follow, follow up on, um, on Worcester. And thank you again to Revelation Studios. And thank you everyone for joining us. And this will be our final word. I hope everyone takes care and remembers that um, wear a mask, save a life. There is free COVID testing throughout the community. If you want more information, please go on the city website um, and also on UMass. Um, let get tested and save a life. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. Uh, you might have a